Hey guys, welcome to the show today. Hey, we have a new sponsor of the show. We haven't done this uh, for a while, but the podcast has been growing and we want to highlight uh, organizations, businesses, companies that are life-affirming, life-supporting, and we want to share them with you as well. And I know the people behind this organization personally. They're called Raise Them Up USA. I'm actually wearing one of their shirts right now. They're proud to be Americans. They're protectors of personal freedom, individual thought, and free speech. And they have an, a phenomenal website and organization, creating a space where families can get encouragement, educated, and equipped to take ownership over the liberty that is theirs in making decisions for their families and their children, especially for you who are families who listen to this show, uh, you probably never felt more of an attack against the, the nuclear family than now, especially as they're trying to do weird, kooky, Planned Parenthood sex ed and racism curriculum to your children in public schools. And we want you to be encouraged with like-minded individuals. They have wonderful resources as well about ethnic studies, what's really the 1619 Project, uh, about your children's education, gun safety, and more. Plus, you can pick up some epic merch. So look at this awesome shirt, N No History, Make History. Plus, for the kids, look at this adorable little shirt, little history maker. Uh, and they've got a lot more shirts as well. So go check them out. Join Raise Them Up USA. Follow them on social media as well to raise yourself higher and your children to understand this nation's history as it's being attacked um, at every turn so they can engage the culture and make history themselves. Raise Them Up USA. Check out their website. Pick up some merch before Christmas for your family and for your kids. Uh, we appreciate them sponsoring this show. And we'll be right back with a whole lot more. <laughs> So today we have an exciting guest on the show. Denisha Workeiser discovered as an adult uh, that she survived her mother's abortion attempts, plural guys, uh, both a chemical abortion and a DNC abortion. Um, we like to bring abortion survivors onto this show and we'll be doing so more again in the future because they're a walking contradiction in the culture of death. Their very existence uh, proves the premises of progressivism wrong, that I guess it wasn't her body, her choice, because her mother's failure to procure reproductive health care led to the human being standing before you, so when did her bodily autonomy rights begin? The left doesn't know what to do with abortion survivors, and it must be very difficult to live as an abortion survivor in a country and under an administration that tells you that you don't have the right to be alive. As an abortion survivor, Denisha brings a unique voice, of course, to humanize the unborn, and she's the founder of Reclaimed Story, an Arizona nonprofit organization to help women reclaim their stories after a painful past. In addition to her work in biblical counseling, Denisha is actively part of the Abortion Survivors Network and serves as their healing program coordinator. You're not going to want to miss this exciting episode. Buckle up. I'm Seth Gruber and this is Unaborted. <laughs> Denisha, welcome to the show today. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. We have, um, our paths have crossed twice now uh, recently in the last year, which has been fun. I was in an event at a church in Tucson, uh, which you came to, and then we were both on stage for CareNet's conference um, earlier or this summer in a speaker spotlight uh, session uh, where we were both sharing sort of our stories and uh, working with pregnancy centers who, of course, are heroes uh, and in this moment, in this time. But um, this is sort of newer to you. So um, you care deeply about uh, the life of the preborn um, and ending abortion in this country. Um, but um, this is a little bit of a newer season in terms of your life in ministry. You've been in, in various forms of ministry, but the battle for life is sort of a new one, and God's using you mightily. Um, so firstly, tell us, um, tell us your story and past. I mean, we know you're an abortion survivor, so we're honored to have uh, you on the show as you continue to just crush leftists and pro-abortion bigotry by merely existing. Um, but we, we want to learn your story and, uh, and how you came to where you're at today and now how God is using you. Awesome. Well, first I have to say thank you so much for all that you're doing, Seth. So much of what I have learned in changing careers and changing my path has come from you and Melissa. And so I really appreciate all that you're doing out there as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I uh, just found out three years ago, actually, that I had survived my mom's abortion attempts, as you said. And so to kind of paint the picture, we had launched um, the ministry the beginning of January 2019. And I started praying a really bold prayer. My prayer was, God, what are we going to stand for? 
like we had John 10, 10, ironically, was our uh, verse that we were holding on to, right? That the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but that Jesus came that we would have life and life abundantly. That's right. Well, that was our passage for Reclaim Story. And so I'm wow. praying, God, I feel like there's something else. Like, what are we going to stand for? There's something we're going to stand for. And one of the things I thought was our local pregnancy center. You know, I had never been involved in the pro-life movement before, but I had supported hmm. my local pregnancy center. And so I thought, okay, are we going to support them? Are we going to, you know, get into helping women come out of sex trafficking? Like, what's our thing? That is a very dangerous prayer. Uh, because I began praying that at the beginning of January 19. And 11 days later, we watched New York light up the whole city pink, right? right in yeah. celebration of being able to have abortions up to nine months in their state. And right. at that time, when that hit, I was real upset about it. Um, I, Like I said, I had not been involved in the pro-life movement, but I was upset. So when I get upset about something, I kind of have an entrepreneurial brain. God bless my husband. So we are in Phoenix at a hotel, and we were there for my daughter's birthday. She wanted to go see a concert, so we were in Phoenix. And we're sitting in the spa, and I'm sort of lamenting about this law. You know, I had read yeah. up on it, and yeah, I'm like, I don't major, understand, yeah. right? I, like, I don't understand how we're celebrating this as human beings. And so right. we are, we're sitting there, and I'm lamenting and trying to solve all the world's problems. And the thought popped in my head ask your dad if your mom ever considered having an abortion with you. Whoa. And I thought it just kind of came in and I thought, I'm sure she did. You know, it was the seventies. I'm sure she did. So I moved on. My husband, and I kept talking probably about 10 minutes later, the thought comes back in my head. And this time I said it out loud. I said to my husband, mm -hmm. I said, I wonder if my mom ever considered having an abortion with me. And he was like, I'm sure she did. Okay. So to paint the picture, she conceives in 1975. So it's legal. She's wow. in California. She's in trouble with the law and about to face some jail time for it. She has an 18-year-old daughter at home, no kids oh. in between, okay, mid-30s. Okay, great time to have a baby. Okay, you know, probably a little tough. So my husband's like, I'm sure she considered it. Think of where she was in life, right? So I'm like, yeah, that's true. We carry on. Well, we're getting ready to leave the pool area. And you know those little, like, rattan baskets that you kind of toss your towel in as you head out the gate? So we're getting ready to leave. I put my hand on, my, on the gate. I put the towel in the basket. And next thing I know, it was like the Lord stopped me. And again, the thought popped in my head. Ask your dad if your mom ever considered having an abortion with you. This time I knew it wasn't just a thought popping in my head, you know. Right. And so I thought, okay, I, I don't think this is me just being curious about this. I think this is really the Lord prompting me. And so I took a step back from the gate. I told my husband and my daughter, I said, you know what, you guys go, go ahead up. And I'll be, I said, I'll be up in a few minutes. So I went back and I sat down in, on, a, on a lawn chair. And I started, to, I, I wish I could say, man, I was obedient. You know, I grabbed my phone, texted my dad and was totally obedient. But to be honest, I sat there and I started counting the cost. Like mm -hmm. I was, so I had, the last time I'd seen my biological dad, I was 11. Fast wow. forward, 30 years went by. I saw him when I was 40, okay? This is now, I'm 42 in this moment I'm at, at the wow. pool. And I'm thinking like, if I ask him this, are, am I gonna ruin this relationship? You know, this is new, we're building this, we're building trust and all the things. And I knew that God was asking me to do it because I thought, okay, three times, I'm a little slow, right? So he wow. had to like prompt a couple times. So yeah. I texted my dad. And I said, hey, weird question for you. I said, you're not going to upset me either way. But for some reason, I want to know, did you and mom ever consider having an abortion with me? And I hit send. And when I sent it, this like, I can't even describe the relief that came off me. It was like, we're done. Okay, go on. And so we went on. We went shopping with my daughter. We just had fun. And about three hours later, my life was about to change. Um, about three hours later, we're standing in Culver's. And I don't know, do you have Culver's out in California? Yeah, well, no, but okay. I, I travel enough to know. Yeah. There you go. So in one hand, I had a concrete mixer. And in the other hand, I had cheese curds. <laughs> and so I was rocking the healthy diet, right? We were on vacation, technically. And so three hours goes by, I'm standing in front of a booth waiting for my husband and my daughter. And next thing you know, my phone vibrates. And so I look down and just kind of catch a glimpse of the message. I click on it and it's my dad. And he says, you don't know, do you? And he said, didn't you ever wonder why we called you a miracle baby? And he said, your mom didn't just think about it. She tried twice. Wow. Oh my gosh. And 
Yeah. I remember just like all no the more blood. Cheese curds, huh? No more cheese curds. Yeah. We weren't, <laughs> we weren't doing anything that day. I just sort of sat down in the booth. I was, I was standing by and, uh, all, I felt like all the blood rushed out of my body. My limbs went numb. And I just sort of sat there for a second. And I thought like, what does that mean now? You know, I'm 42, you know, talk about a midlife crisis, right? right. I'm 42. Like what else in my life was a lie or, mm. You know, what else, what type of rejection, like all these things start right. just flooding me. And I didn't quite know how to process it. So that was the day that I found out and crazy how to find, you know, how I found out. And a couple weeks went by. I finally got the nerve to call my sister. Okay. We're 18 years apart. And when I first called wow. my sister, she said, yeah, she's like, Hi. she goes, oh, I said, did mom ever consider having an abortion with me? And she goes, oh, honey, no, mom wanted you so much. She was so excited to have you. And I thought, wow. okay, right, I'm still gaining a relationship with my dad. And so I said, well, here's what dad told me. And she flipped on a dime and was like, would you quit digging up stuff on our family? And she's like, yes, Ma, I remember the day mom went in for the actual procedure. And oh she God. said, you know, she says, honey, she says, you've got to stop this. And I'm like, this wasn't my fault. <laughs> right. So it yeah, was... Yeah. Totally wow. God led. And so wow. what my dad ended up telling me was in October of 75, my mom found out she was pregnant. Again, painted a picture of kind of what her life looked like at the time. And in November, she took what was off the market at the time, but she took four white pills, which were the abortion pills. Um, mm -hmm. The first two were to stop you know, the life of the baby, me. And then the second two was to cause her body to expel the baby. And so she took those and in December found out she was still pregnant. So wow. she went in and had a full DNC abortion in December. So, you know, situations taken care of. She thinks the pregnancy has been ended. Everything now she moves on with listeners life. listeners exactly what a DNC is. I, I haven't done an episode in a while where I've actually described the different types um, and what happens. So tell, tell our listeners exactly what that was intended to do. Yeah, so a DNC is where the doctor opens up the woman's cervix and he goes in and scrapes um, any tissue, including the baby, right? And it scrapes her uterus and takes out the contents of it. Yeah, so no um, vacuum. No vacuum, yeah. Right. And that was in December of 1975. And wow. two months later, in February of 76, she discovered she was still pregnant, but now she was four to five months along. Wow. Wait, so how old were you uh, with the second attempt? Uh, so February, it was, she was four to five months. So I was about eight weeks in November. So right okay. about 12 weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because so, I've, I've, I've sometimes wondered, you know, I guess it's just because abortionists are just that sick um, that they're not even aware of the fact that they failed. You know what I mean? Like right. sometimes you wonder, like, how did you not, how did you not know that you hadn't successfully killed the baby? Like, you know, you're supposed to see little feet and hands. Like, how did you think it was successful? That's always been confusing to me. But I guess uh, I'd be actually I'd be interested to hear your perspective. But I guess it's just because they're just moving as fast as they can to make as much money as they can. They really don't care at all about the baby or the mother, both are who are treated as prospects for cash. Um, but so were you even harmed? No, I wasn't harmed. Praise God. And wow. yeah, and we don't know exactly. There's, we don't know why I survived it. Um, my dad's thoughts were one of two things. Uh, my mom did tend to use abortion as a form of birth control. So earlier that year she had had another procedure. And so wow. my dad thought either one of two things, the doctor was kind of tired of her shenanigans and he wasn't going to perform it and go through the motions, but didn't actually oh, wow. do it or to that. I possibly had a twin, but we won't know. I mean, those are our speculations, but we won't know either way. Right. So, or he's just incredibly bad at his job, which is, I guess, a blessing. Right. <laughs> right? Yes. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but yeah. Oh man. So have were you in relationship with your mother? for your whole life? Yes. So the reason that I couldn't ask my mom, uh, my mom raised me, uh, she passed away in 2001. Okay. So there was no way to, you know, find out the details there. Um, so that's why 
here the Lord brought my dad back into my life after 30 years, you know, to wow. see him in person. And, and yeah. then I asked him that wow. question, right? Like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. So this, this is all right after Cuomo and Hillary Clinton team up together to, to pass the uh, Reproductive Health Act and celebrate abortion through point of birth in New York, which, which I've, I'm finding more and more, Denisha, um, impacted a lot of people. I've been meeting a lot of people who tell me that the reason they got involved in the pro-life fight most recently was because of just the brazenness of, of Cuomo in New York. Because you and I know that most people don't know that abortion's legal through all nine months of pregnancy already at the federal level. But to see a state legislature and, and governor just stand up there and, and erupt in, in applause with passing it and then, and then lighting the One World Trade Center pink, I mean, it should have been lit red to represent the, the, the murder of the unborn happening under that state's governance, was, was just so brazen that even you're, you're sort of like, I'm personally pro-life, but it should remain legal, people. Even they were like, okay, screw this. What can I do <laughs> to fight this genocide? So I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that, you know, that that was a, a turning point for you too. But what a difficult thing to walk through. Um, this is something that Melissa and I have talked about before, is that we all acknowledge the trauma and, and harm that occurs to children when they're mistreated in the early stages of their life. Um, and, and psychologists and doctors, you know, all acknowledge this, that if children are abused, even as infants, you know, or one, two, three years old, even if they don't remember it, that, that it can have incredible lifelong trauma and impact them in various negative ways, that there's a ton of fallout physically, psychologically, spiritually, socially, from being abused as a young child, even if you don't have a recollection of it. Uh, and, but, oh, but if you're in the womb and, and the instruments were rubbing against your body and you were being poked and prodded and attempted to be murdered while in the location created to be the safest, oh, well, that won't impact you. Oh, that won't have any impact. You, you won't suffer any consequences from, from remembering that or being told it happened even though you don't remember it. It's, it's just so, it's so wicked. And it just, it's, it's, it's all a part of the left's pl ploy, which is to simply filter out of sight, like monkey no see, filter out of sight any recognition of the fact that there is a separate human being bearing the injuries of choice. Uh, because any recognition of the humanity of that child destroys the, your entire narrative and the entire sort of ideological foundation that you've built your worldview on, which is that there isn't another body. There's just her body. And anything in her body is just her property, just like they treated slaves. Um, and so what was that journey and experience like for you in the next two years or so following that? For, for, I mean, for your emotional health and, and psychological health, like what was that experience like coming to terms with that and then living in that new reality? It's been interesting to say the least. Um, you know, it's hard to be a survivor in a world that does say, number one, you don't exist. And number two, I, when I found out my story, I was serving as a pastor at our church. I had been a pastor for 10 years at our church. And so that reality, uh, the first thing I did was go to our leadership, right? I'm like, okay, so here's the deal. <laughs> wow. Kind of found out some information and it's about to change my life. Like, and wow. I knew that, you know, here I'm praying, what am I going to stand for? And little mm. did I know how much John 10, 10 was going to come to life. Right? right so right. I was, uh, our leadership said, you know, you, you can absolutely get out there. You can, you know, advocate, you can do whatever you'd like. We just, we're not going to mix the two worlds. And so Cowards. I thought. Well, I thought, okay, okay, that's, you know, okay, so here I'm a pastor, you know, out there I can be, you know, pro-life and I just have to be careful not to merge worlds. Well, my merge, my worlds merged regardless, right? So do you remember when Melissa yeah. and Claire you're an, launched you're the You're an embodied faces, person. <laughs> right. When, when they launched the Faces of Choice um, yeah. ad at the March for Life. Right. And so that goes live, goes viral on Facebook, social media, all the things. And that next Sunday, I opened my car door. It was a normal Sunday, right? This is my normal life, my normal Sunday. I get to church about seven in the morning and I was supposed to be in a class at nine o'clock to teach. I opened my car door, put my foot on the ground and a woman came up to me right, right at the car and said, I saw your video 
I had an abortion too, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, she said, I saw your video and she said, I had an abortion and I've never told anybody about it. Yeah. Well, at that moment, I realized my worlds were about to collide. Yeah. And over the next two hours, I had four women come to me, two of which no said way. that they have never shared that before to anybody. I mean, not no way. Uh, it's duh. But yes, I mean, yeah. Wow. Right. Because you gave so them permission think, to speak. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I think two things sort of happened, right? Like one, you know, I became the face of choice um, and I I have a lot of compassion for my mom and the fact that she passed away with this huge secret. She raised wow. me, got up every day, realizing that she's taking care of this child who she tried to murder before I even took my first breath, right? And so I had a ton of compassion for just what my mom had gone through and that was portrayed through the video. So I began having women come to me and my worlds collided, I mean, in a huge way. So mm. I think that was my first eye opener of what it was like to be mm. a, a survivor in today's world. Um, and then I have to say social media, scrolling through social media, watching the news, that has been a big um, eye opener for me when the yeah. Texas heartbeat law passed. And, you know, here I'm celebrating, right? Like, this is great. You know, this is this is a step in the right direction for mm -hmm. us. And then seeing all of the comments on Facebook, seeing all of the yeah. things on the news and, and you feel really alienated really fast. You know, yeah. and it, oh, totally. it almost feels like an attempt to dehumanize you personally. So I, there's been a whirlwind of, of emotions, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But we're not alone either. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've connected with over 400 survivors. And from physical things to emotional needs to all of these different right. things that we can all say me too. So first, I don't yeah. feel crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. I feel like, I, and when I stand up, I feel like I'm standing in linking arms with with everyone. And so right. it feels like a battle, to be honest. Um, but here's what I feel is that people can argue with my opinion, but they can't argue with my experience. Yeah, and yeah. so just praying for God to use all of us mightily in this time that is very confusing, you know, especially right. for yeah. survivors or for everyone. You know, the truth yeah. just isn't That's coming right. out the way it should. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I said recently on social media, I said that, that pro-choice <laughs> involves a certain level of self-hatred because what you're saying is that my mother had the right to murder me. Um, it's like, oh, that's kind of weird, bro. <laughs> it's kind of weird you'd say that. Do you not love yourself? Like, are you, are you bummed that your mom didn't kill you in the womb? Like, I, like so being pro-choice involves this like certain level of almost like self-hatred that like, oh yeah, like I was a non-person blob of tissue in my mother's womb and she could have killed me. Because you're saying my mother had the right to get an abortion. Well, dude, that, that was you, you weirdo. That's super weird to say, man. <laughs> so it's interesting because there's, there's, a, there's a certain level of dehumanization towards every human being when you espouse the pro-choice position. Because you're saying you weren't you Denisha, when you were in your mother's womb. You were something else, and I don't know when you became you. I don't know, I guess the fetus fairy you know, flew up and sprinkled magical personhood conferring fairy dust. I don't really know, can't answer that question, don't make me think so deeply about this issue, Denisha, but you know, you weren't you in the womb, that's all I know. Uh, and so you know, there is a certain level of dehumanization directed at every human being when you say that. Um, but that's only intensified, I can imagine, tenfold for abortion survivors. Because you're sitting there going, no, 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 my, my mother tried to murder me. So, you know, I can't imagine being an abortion survivor and looking at a pro-choicer and being like, you're espousing the mother's right to kill you, yet your mother didn't try to kill you, but mine did. So, you know, keep your bigotry in your own mouth. You know, like I would, I would get so, you know, angry and fired up if I was an abortion survivor. It's probably good I'm not. I'd probably get myself in too much trouble. But that's why I love supporting, you know, your guys' organization and ministry uh, and each of your platforms and telling your story because these are the, the faces of choice. And, and the, the, it's almost like, like escaped criminals from the, from the prison of progressivism. It's like you weren't supposed to get out of our ideological prison. Now you're running around as a walking contradiction because your very existence calls into question the fundamental claims of the pro-choice position. So shut up. And that's why they want abortion survivors to shut up so much. So, so speak loudly, speak more loudly, and let us know what we can do to help you. But it reminds me of something Abraham Lincoln once said. He said, um, every time I hear someone arguing for slavery, 
I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on him personally. <laughs> and, and I would put a spin on that. Every time I hear someone arguing for abortion, I feel a strong impulse to see him aborted. Now, I mean, I don't obviously want them to be killed, but I'm saying it's like, it's like, oh, look at you with your born privilege. Like, you weren't aborted. Like, what if, what if your mom decided that she didn't want you to be around anymore? Uh, you know, it's, it's just so brazen, and it's just so sick. But, um, so, I got off on a sidetrack there. So, so pumped on your story. Um, how did you then end up at the Abortion Survivors Network? So, continue your story. So, about two months go by. And I'm convinced I am like a freak of nature. Like who survives an abortion, right? Like that wow. clearly, you know, somebody wasn't doing their job. So yeah. I remember I was Googling one night and I finally got the nerve to type, do people survive abortions? And I was fully mm. ready for it to say, no, <laughs> nobody has ever survived an abortion, just you, right. you know? And so you do, you feel alone. And the first person that popped up with was Melissa and with the Abortion Survivors Network. So took me a couple of days, but I remember I crafted an email, sent it to her, and I said, okay, so, like, is this really a thing? Are there really more like us? And that's mm. the first thing people ask, by the way. Is this really a yeah. thing? Is that a thing? Right. I'm like, it's a thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a thing. Yeah. We're a thing. We're here. And so <laughs> Melissa responded right back and said, right. you know, hey, we're here for you. And I just began to get involved. And I found family. Like, it's amazing. It's amazing how much you have in common with other survivors. I mean, you could almost take a room and put us all in corners. If you survived a saline, you know, infusion abortion over here, wow. if you survived a chemical abortion over here, and the things that we have in common from the abortions we survived is mm. just fascinating. So yeah, a couple, wow. couple years now, um, working with Melissa and just learning a ton from you and from her and and oh, yeah, yeah just working with survivors huge. worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> it has, it has. I'm learning a lot about as fast yeah. as I can, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you did an incredible job at CareNet. Um, for the listeners of this show, um, I was in uh, was it San Antonio um, in August or something like that for the CareNet conference. Um, and actually, for you guys listening to the show, this is kind of a, a hoot. I actually submitted a breakout session um, for CareNet, and it was rejected. Um, and I think it's because they probably are familiar with me, and they're like, he, he's too fiery for CareNet. We're not going to let him speak. Uh, but then the Ambassador Speakers Bureau, which represents you and I, uh, they ended up putting us on the main stage for the Speaker Spotlight series. And so Denisha here did an incredible job sharing her story. You, you were definitely holding the audience in the palm of your hand. And, and when, you, when you rounded out the story, I mean, people were like, people were moved. That room, that you, you could have heard a penny drop. Um, because, because these are the most sobering, um, stories from the abortion industry because all women are harmed from abortion um, and, and they're silent. But they're, we know they're everywhere because they were the ones that weren't killed. But it, it's the babies who survived, who are now adults, um, whose, whose voices are the most powerful. And most people have not met abortion survivors. Most people, like you, Denisha, didn't even think that was a thing. Um, and, and so th those stories just grip people. And that's why you know and Melissa knows that, you, that you're, constantly, you're frequently told by the left, that's not true. That's not true. Don't lie. Don't lie to get speaking events. Like, no, I, no I'm not lying. I did survive an abortion. Um, so how, how is God moving now throughout your life and abortion survivors network? Because, I mean, God really opened your world a lot. Here, you, here you've got all these post-abortion, post-abortive women coming to you. By the way, is your church telling you we're not going to combine the two? What cowards? I mean, like, my, my friend Mike Spencer says that um, pastor's silence on abortion doesn't spare the men and women in his church hurt. It spares them healing. Um, because the fact that they're in your church is the very reason you should address it. So, of course, you have to combine the two in your life, Denisha. I mean, what, what, what a stupid thing to tell you, your, your pastoral colleagues, to keep them separate. It's like, no, 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 no. We're only in this predicament because the church has, has chosen to abdicate their role to speak life and protect the preborn. So how did God start using you in the lives of women? Um, oh. and, then, and, then, and then with other abortion survivors and, and everything. Yeah, it's... So I left my position on staff uh, last April of 2020. Um, so now I am doing this full time. And Wonderful. when 
when I left staff, it was, it was very, it's a hard move, right? I'm like, I'm going to retire from here. I'm going to do all this stuff. But God made it super clear. Like, nope, here's what we're doing now. And, uh, so it's been very interesting. Um, for the first thing, so I've talked to a lot of pastors and there's been a lot of different opinions that I've gotten. I've had the pastors, like you said, I've had pastors who have said that's political. We can't get involved. And to that, I would say you're already involved. You know, yep, one, right. one out of four women sitting in the, that church, and I experienced that firsthand in a two-hour period alone the first day that I yeah, came out with my right. story. So I would say you're already living that. And I love what you just said is you're preventing healing there. Um, yeah. So I've talked to pastors who said it's a political thing. We can't get involved. They've heard my story, and a few of them have yeah. kind of gotten a fire in their belly. Like, I'm going to get up and I'm going to talk about this. Well, then we have to have another conversation because yeah. you can talk about pro-life, but you have to understand there's women and men who are hurting right in your congregation. Yeah. And yeah. so I've encouraged just a healing program to start with a healing program, offer a place for them to go to find healing so right, they right. can talk about it, so you can totally. talk about it and all yeah. hand in hand. Um, I think one of the uh, most interesting calls that I had, I was brand new to this, right? Like I was a jeweler for 20 years, a pastor for 10. Like I know jewelry and Jesus. That's about what I've got, (laughs) right? My skill set. And uh, so I, one day I answered my phone and it was like two o'clock in the afternoon and I answered my phone and the person on the other end of the line said, I understand, you know, a lot about abortion. The Hmm. look on my face was like, Oh no, (laughs) like something's about to happen and I'm probably not prepared. And so I remember stopping for a second, just being like, all right, Lord, guide me with this. Hmm. So she began to tell me, uh, I said, yeah, you know, I do know a lot about abortion. You know, tell me about your situation. So she told me her situation, a mutual friend had given her my number and she was seven weeks pregnant. Now here's what's interesting. She wanted to know the difference between a DNC abortion, like an abortion procedure surgically or the Hmm. abortion pill. And as soon as she said that, I thought, game on, like, we got this, right? So I was like, okay. So we keep talking and we kind of became fast friends. And so she told me what her family had told her. Her family was very pro-abortion, history in her family of abortion, just all the things, right? And so she didn't call me to ask if she should have one. She just wanted to know what type. And a friend said that I knew a lot about abortion. So as we're talking about 45 minutes in, I said, do you mind if I share my story with you? And she said, yeah, absolutely. And I thought, here we go. All right, Lord, this is yours. This is your story. Let's do this. So I shared my story and all of a sudden she paused and she said four words. And at that moment, I realized how powerful my story was. She said, you're like my baby. And I stopped and I said, yeah, you know, I am. But the difference is you don't have to make the same decision that my mom did. You can make a different decision. And so total stranger. I ended up getting to pick her up. Um, a few days later, we made an appointment at our local pregnancy center. She went down, met with them, got wow. to see her baby a couple days later. And then I got the best phone call of my life. And that was the day that she called me and said, Denisha, I'm going to keep my baby. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I thought, Lord, I will do this every day, all day. Yeah, Let's go do awesome. this. Like that yeah, was, yeah. yeah. So that was pretty neat. Amazing. Yeah. Life saved. See, Yep. Speak truth and speak it all the time. I've been saying that more and more. Never let pro-abortion bigotry uh, go by without being called out as such. Now, you can do that graciously, of course. You know, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more of the hammer in search of a nail kind of speaker. Um, but you know, we you're going to you. temp- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to temper your message, obviously, depending on the person. But but what I what regardless, you know, it's still bigotry. Like that that woman was in entertaining bigotry, which was that her baby was not a person and could be killed. She may have felt pressured, she might have felt scared, but bigotry is still bigotry. And and God's going to use people, particularly you and those who have survived this this murderous procedure, to say, well, would you have killed me? Because I was still me in the womb, <laughs> you know. And, and so that's, praise God, what, I love those stories. I love how God uses uh, redemptive stories uh, to redeem people and, uh, and to keep them from making the same decision. So praise God. Well, I can't think of a, of a better way to end than that than with um, God using you to save the lives of little babies who uh, will one day thank you. Um, for, for speaking life into their mother. Um, how can people connect with you uh, to learn more um, or to um, book you as a speaker if they're interested in having you up for an event? 
Yep, you can find me on Instagram or on Facebook under Denisha Workheiser and also um, through the Abortion Survivors Network. Wonderful. Awesome, Denisha. Well, thank you for joining the show today. Uh, guys, go check out um, Denisha Workheiser, um, Abortion Survivors Network. Check her out on social media. Um, and we, we are creating a, a coalition uh, in this country of like-minded pro-life individuals across um, theological lines and even political lines, even though I don't think there's any justification to, to stay in today's Democrat Party. But, but many uh, moderate Democrats are done with their party. And, and they're, they don't like abortion through point of birth. And, and, and it's so cool to see how God's aligning all of these different types of people, abortion survivors, former abortionists, you know, uh, people who are still in the Democrat Party who are pro-life, uh, progressives, atheists who are, who are pro-life, uh, conservative Christians. And I've never seen so many people sort of aligning before. Um, across these lines um, to, to fight against the left and their greatest sacrament of abortion. And so it's so fun to meet so many new people, and it's incredible how many people have connected with Abortion Survivors Network just since the beginning of 2021. I mean, your guys' growth has been wild, um, and I can't help but imagine it's because of sort of just how the enemy has overplayed his hand and, and how the Democrat Party is doubling down on insisting on their crazy sex ed, insisting on abortion, Merrick Garland threatening to send in federal troopers into Texas because they, they're choosing to save babies. I mean, the, the, the lines couldn't be drawn more clearly in the sand. Uh, and so people are being forced to kind of return to those most fundamental questions. What are natural rights? Where do natural rights come from? What do I believe? Um, and, and so people are coming to the surface more and more now, I think, uh, finding a spine, finding courage, and I can't think of a more powerful voice that we could present to the culture than a whole hundreds, 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 hundreds of abortion survivors saying, we're here, we exist, and you failed to kill us, and you're not going to kill babies anymore. <laughs> and so um, whatever you need, whatever the network needs, you let me know. We're so excited to stand with you. Any final words uh, for our listeners or anything that's on your heart before we close out? I would just say, let's keep standing. Keep standing. This is what we're going to stand for. That's right. That's right. Amen. Yeah, I think at some point uh, we've got to work on something together to get every abortion survivor in the country who wants to uh, outside of Margaret Sanger Abortion Center or something like that, something to make a mainstream, the mainstream media couldn't ignore. Uh, we, we've got to continue raising up your guys' voices. So thank you for having the courage to, to share your story, Denisha. Thank you for sharing your heart with us. Guys, go connect with her. Pray for her. Pray for the Abortion Survivors uh, Network. And we'll pray that God keeps using you to change minds, change hearts, and save lives. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you soon. Uh, guys, thanks for joining the show today. Uh, if you uh, enjoyed this episode uh, in this show, give us a rating and review. Let us know what you think. It really helps. Head on over to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube. Subscribe. Give us five stars. Let us know what you think. Share it with a friend. Share this episode with a pro-choice friend and ask him or her whether Denisha should be murdered or not or whether she should have been alive. That's a great conversation starter over coffee. If you want to support the show, head on over to patreon.com forward slash unaborted and look at our tiers and perks. Just as a little thank you for supporting the show. It helps us increase our production value, bring in more guests in studio, and, and create more diverse types of content out on the streets. As well, if you want to see my speaking schedule or book me for an event, go to sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com. Thank you so much for joining the show today. We'll see you next week. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs>